Good morning. Welcome to Life in Christ Lutheran Church in Peoria, Arizona. We are so glad that you could join us for worship this morning. For those of you who actually live in the Phoenix area, we would love to have you join us in person uh, when you feel safe to do so. We worship at 8 o'clock, 9.15, and 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings here on campus. For those of you who are not in the Phoenix area, we're glad that you could join us this morning. As part of the Lutheran Church at Missouri Synod, we focus on the death and resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins and the source for our life in Christ. Community is important, and we are glad that you are part of our online community, especially this morning. We hope that you can be a part of a similar community wherever you live as we partner in the gospel, receive the forgiveness of sins, and proclaim the grace of God all to his glory. Speaking of partnership, many of you partner with us by sending in your tithes and your offerings. It's part of how we worship God. If you would like to partner with us in this way, please don't hesitate to uh, mail a contribution to the church or utilize Zelle. Information for both of those platforms can be found on our website. We begin our worship this morning with prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the opportunity to come before you this morning in prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. Pour out your Holy Spirit. Guide our thoughts, our words, and our actions, that everything we do would be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We begin our worship this morning in song.
God has called us to worship this morning, and so we begin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends in Christ, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Friends in Christ, Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you. And for his sake, he forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the Kyrie. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us upon us. Amen. We join our hearts in prayer. O God, from whom all good proceeds, grant to us, your humble servants, your holy inspiration, that we may set our minds on the things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue in worship this morning as we are fed by God's Word. The Old Testament lesson this morning comes to us from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, verses 7 through 9. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. So hear the word I speak, and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade him from his ways, that wicked man will die for his sin, and I will hold you accountable for his blood. But if you do warn the wicked man to turn from his ways, and he does not do so, he will die for his sin, but you will have saved yourself. The epistle lesson for this morning comes to us from Romans chapter 13. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror. For those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant 
an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding, except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be, are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now the Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child and had him stand among them. And he said, I tell you the truth. Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. But if anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And now we confess our common Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue our worship in song.
let's take a moment and join our hearts in prayer. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, for indeed you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, we're going to take what we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks from St. Matthew's Gospel and jump over to Romans chapter 13. Partially because it's good to see how these two sections of Scripture mesh together. God's kingdom is known as the kingdom of the right. And God's kingdom flourishes in the world. The world is known as the kingdom of the left. And so as God's people, we kind of have feet in both kingdoms. One foot on one side, one foot on the other. Because we are God's people living in the world. Because our epistle lesson uh, has a number of different interpretations, it's helpful for us to grasp what is going on and see where we fit in the text and what that means for our ministry as God's people in today's world. To quickly summarize from Matthew's Gospel, the big themes or nuggets that we've been talking about the last few weeks are these. Compassion, cleansing, confession, and confidence. God reaches out in compassion to outsiders. He cleanses all of us from all of our sin as he has brought us into his kingdom. We confess the Son of Man to be Jesus Christ, the same who gave his life as a ransom for many. For he truly is the way, the truth, and the life. This confession is what Christ builds his church upon. And it's a church so strong that not even the gates of hell will prevail. Finally, just as important as the others, Christ Jesus is our confidence. His payment on our behalf is sufficient. His plan is perfect. His reward is ours. All of this is finished for us by his death and resurrection. Our Lord accomplished this through the cross. His death and his resurrection, events that took place almost 2,000 years ago. Because of this, although we taste death and sometimes endure suffering, we will rise in triumph, just like he did. Because we are already triumphant through his resurrection. That is what we are baptized into. And no one can take it from us. And it's important for us to revisit this reality over and over again. Especially as we get into our epistle lesson this morning. Because it forms the framework for understanding what Paul is saying here. We have victory in Christ, and our victory is a cosmic, eternal victory that will never be taken from us. God promises that. Signed, sealed, delivered, it's yours, even this very moment. But in the meantime, this kingdom of God is still growing. Lost sheep are still being found. God is still calling those who are in the world, in darkness, to come into his marvelous light. And we are part of that too, as ambassadors of reconciliation. As we are in the world, engaged in the ministry that God has given us, we need to acknowledge that our government and those who are in authority over us are given to us in those positions as a gift from God. Now, sometimes we find ourselves scratching our heads about that. 
but it's true. As St. Paul says, they are a gift from God Almighty. They do not wield the sword for nothing. They have a job, and they are charged by God's authority to do that job. Their job is to keep us safe and to keep society and those in it at peace with one another. Now, of course, we all have our pet gripes concerning our government and how it operates, especially in these days. But for the most part, our government does an okay job. Generally speaking, we live at peace with one another. And when they fail to do their job, or when they make mistakes, we are blessed to have a mechanism for dealing with that in our government. We don't need to be rebellious. Rather, we vote them out of office. Or we seek legal means to make necessary changes. And we'll have an opportunity to do that again in a couple of months. Paul speaks this way because any and all authority in this world has been given and established by God. Jesus also says in Matthew chapter 28, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, St. Paul says, be subject to the governing authorities. Because there's no authority apart from the authority of God. He is the supreme authority in all of creation. And all authority has been given and established by him. Paul admonishes us this way because in part it's difficult for us to submit to authority. We don't naturally want to do it. It really is a part of our sinful human nature to rebel against authority, whatever that authority is. And for that, we need to repent of that desire and those attitudes because they're born in sin. And we act on those desires and those attitudes more often than we would like to admit. Sure, we rationalize them. Six ways from Sunday, but the truth remains. Especially in times like these, it is of utmost importance that we consider the example of Christ. He knew that he was suffering unjustly. He knew that he was going to wrongfully be sentenced to death and die in one of the most painful and excruciating ways ever devised by man. The writer of Hebrews tells us that with this knowledge, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its shame, that we might taste the victory over sin and death. His submission to authority meant death for him. But it brings life to you and me. His submission is what you and I are baptized into. It's what we eat and drink at the rail from the altar as he gives us his body and blood. His submission to the Jewish and even the Roman authority was really a submission to God the Father. According to our epistle lesson this morning. His submission brings you and me the forgiveness of our sins. It brings us life everlasting. And not just us, but the whole world. Not just the kingdom on the right, but also the kingdom on the left. Friends in Christ, Jesus' submission does more than just wipe our slate clean. It does that. But it does even more. God's design is that his kingdom, the kingdom on the right, would be spread through our submission to the governing authorities as we get behind Jesus and follow our submissive Christ to the cross of Calvary. It might be one of the most difficult exercises we can engage in, but it's what God calls us to do. 
and we call this a theology or study, really a chasing after or following God. A theology of the cross or a chasing after God to the cross. This theology leads us to worship holistically with all that we are and all of our time, wherever we are. As we engage this theology of the cross, we do so with the full knowledge that sometimes we suffer. And sometimes we walk with those who suffer. But we also know that the victory has already been won in Christ Jesus. And we are free to share that victory with those around us through the forgiveness of sins and the hope of life everlasting. As, for, as forgiven children of God, we live our life in Christ this way. In his victorious forgiveness, worshiping with all that we are, with our time, our talents, even our treasures as God prescribes in Scripture. And equally important, we reach out to that left-hand kingdom, the world around us, paying whatever needs to be paid. If it's taxes, then taxes. Respect, then respect. Honor, then honor. Suffering, then suffering. Leave no debt outstanding, except for the debt that we cannot pay in full, which is to love one another. But chase that one with all that we are, especially with the full knowledge that Christ has already paid that debt and his love overflows in you and through you as you love one another. Christ, whom we confess, calls us to this action in this way as we, with compassion, engage the kingdom of the world around us. Following him is our response to his grace, and we follow with confidence. And now may the peace which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until the day of his return. Amen. We continue in our worship this morning with the prayers of the church. O oh Lord, grant to your people courage that with boldness we may speak your name in witness of your love and grace. Give your church wisdom and strength by your spirit that she may be steadfast, unmovable in your word and truth. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gracious God, give us good and honest leaders who will govern according to your word and will. Give us grace that we may not fail to pray for those who lead us and to act as good citizens and good neighbors to one another. Give peace to the nations. Bring an end to violence prejudice, and racism. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, deliver us from pandemic and pestilence, from disaster and danger, and from sudden death, that, kept in faith, we may be preserved through this mortal life, and in death be received into the arms of your mercy and into the blessed rest of life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, you are the strength of the weak, the healing of the sick, the comfort of those who grieve, and the peace of those near death. Hear us as we silently pray for those we love and care for. Lord, may all be sustained in their afflictions, comforted in life and in death, and delivered to everlasting life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. We close in song. Once again, I want to thank you for joining us in worship this morning here at Life in Christ. We are grateful for the news that we continue to receive this week, that trends are growing more favorable as far as COVID-19 goes. We pray that, that numbers would fall uh, and that these trends would continue. I hope that wherever you are, uh, you have favorable news along the same lines. We look forward to getting together in worship and in uh, Bible class and Sunday school and all of those things soon, as soon as it is safe. Um, we will certainly communicate uh, when those decisions are made, but please keep these things in your prayers. I ask that you go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.